welcome back everybody um we have the honor of having the great professor ruben meza here with us today and thank you for coming all the way from san antonio and i am delighted to welcome you and we are going to listen to your my mpn journey thank you ruben Well, it's, it's fabulous being here. It, as I shared with the physician audience yesterday, I, I'm so grateful that unlike 2019, I don't have to begin with an apology about Donald Trump. So, it's a, <laughs> it's, 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 so, 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 so th th that is a positive. Now, now, when Claire gave me this title, I, again, didn't want to probably that I myself have had to walk in your shoes, but I certainly have tried to, to empathize, you know, and help in people's MPN journey in the best way they can. But I wanted to reflect a little bit about really what the MPN journey overall has looked like in that during my career, I have really seen a, a tremendous amount of progress that I hope we leave you here today with, with a tremendous sense of hope. You know, I reflect back on the very first patient that I saw as a first year medical student uh, back in 1991 with myelofibrosis and the progress that we have made since. Here are my disclosures. So I've been involved with, I think, almost every drug developed in MPNs over the last 30 years. So, so how did I get involved with, with MPN? So a little bit of my backstory. I'm originally a Chicagoan. I'm, I'm from Cuba, but from Chicago, and then grew up in the state of, of Illinois. But got interested in, in blood conditions uh, early on. I had a, a friend that had been afflicted by leukemia. So this is back to science for back in 1982. Uh, I will shamelessly point out the blue ribbon uh, over the, uh, uh, over the uh, poster there, drugs used in chemotherapy. Amazingly, hydroxycarbamide in that list back in that 1982 list. A and boy, the progress that we have made in these diseases since. I did my training up at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. It's a rather a frigid place. This is just a typical summertime spot of, of Minnesota. It's, it's almost Moscow-like in terms of, of weather. But my journey with MPNs really began by the institution that I was at, in that indeed uh, the Mayo Clinic, along with a few other handful of institutions around the world, really have had this as an area of focus. And even early on in my training was really able to meet many amazing patients with tremendous spirit uh, really from around the world that had faced these diseases. And at Mayo Clinic, Murray Silverstein was one of kind of the early fathers of MPNs, really in terms of developing new therapies. Uh, the Anagrolide trial was conducted there at Mayo Clinic with many key colleagues and mentors. But as with many careers, mentorship and learning from people that are passionate about the diseases is a critical piece. Indeed, just as you can imagine, the people that, that Professor Harrison and others really have mentored over the years in many ways have created a lot of the MPN physician community that you have here in the UK. So I worked with Dr. Ayelu Teferi, very, very passionate individual who again, recruited me to some degree to say, you know, there is this difficult set of diseases. How do we do better? I then moved to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona, taking some of the lessons learned from uh, the experience at, in Minnesota. And then now more recently to San Antonio, a great city about 300 years old uh, in the south of Texas, that again, where I overall lead a cancer center. So in addition to MPNs, I oversee about 1,500 individuals involved with the care of all blood diseases and all cancers and have a little bit of the perspective where MPNs both fit in that mix as well as we kind of learn from certain diseases and really try to apply some of those lessons in other areas. Now, as I reflect back on the MPNs, there was really a critical watershed moment which was 2005 with the discovery of the JAK2 mutation. But what had occurred kind of before 2005? Well, first, we had a fairly good idea of the function of the bone marrow at a high level. The bone marrow making the critical cells that we need, the factory for the blood, red cells, white cells, platelets. 
And any one of these cells, if we have too many or too few, can be harmful with many different potential causes. Now, in 2005, when we worked to understand whether someone had an MPN or not, a lot of times we really weren't certain. And we were trying to exclude other causes that could look like an MPN. If someone had too many red blood cells, we had a whole reason of potential secondary causes. Maybe they had sleep apnea. Maybe they lived at high altitude. Maybe they had uh, other reasons for that. If they had a high plate account, again, there were a range of other reasons, ranging from iron deficiency to inflammation or infection. Or if someone had scarring in the bone marrow, again, many different reasons. So pre-2005, first, we were a lot less certain about the diagnosis. And sometimes only time did we, were we really more certain before the discovery of the mutations. Now, the myeloproliferative neoplasms have changed names a whole bunch of times. And indeed, the name was first myeloproliferative syndromes or disorders going back to the 1950s, where a very famous American hematologist looked at a group of different diseases, some of which we now recognize as MPNs, ET, P. vera, myelofibrosis, which at that point we had called something else. We had called it agnogenic myeloid metaplasia. Again, there have been over 40 different names for the illness of myelofibrosis. Now, our therapies before 2005 were really quite rudimentary. We, at a high level, one, had some confidence in terms of trying to decrease the risk of blood clots or bleeding in ET and PV. We learned it was important to control the hematocrit, how many red cells there were. There was discussion on aspirin, and we'll get around to that in a moment. And there was selective use of medicine to control the counts, including hydroxycarbamide, which has been present since that time. There were many medicines we used to use, some of which we use much less these days because of risks, such as even the giving of radioactive phosphorus to decrease blood counts, which we learned over time was not a good idea. This, was, this uh, could lead to secondary leukemias and is something we rarely do. We learned that myelofibrosis, of course, had many burdens it gave patients, enlarged spleen, anemia, symptoms. And there was just the beginning of consideration of stem cell transplant for myelofibrosis. At first, they feared transplant would not work. There was scarring in the bone marrow. If you transplanted someone, where would the cells go? There was that fear. We've learned over time that was not warranted. The cells still find a niche and are able to grow. But indeed, we have learned much. Now, even aspirin, those on aspirin now, when I started my career, we did not use aspirin. There was the fear that had been an early study in the 60s where they gave four adult aspirin and they had an increased risk of bleeding from ulcers. And again, it was around dose. So there was another study done, a low dose aspirin, a baby aspirin or 100 milligrams, and indeed did show a benefit in patients with PV, which is where we use it since. There were clinical trials done to show the benefit of hydroxycarbamide versus doing nothing for individuals that were high risk for ET. So that was proven to be beneficial. Wasn't necessarily tested against other things, but hydroxycarbamide versus nothing was clearly better for decreasing that risk. Anagrolide was approved on the basis of trials from my institution at Mayo Clinic, where again, it was shown that it could decrease the platelets. Now, clinical trials in that era were different. Back in those days, there was a cardboard box underneath Murray Silverstein's desk. There was a clipboard. I remember witnessing this. Someone would come in, they would sign their name on the clipboard, patient 13, he would hand them six months worth of an agrolide, tell them to come back in six months with blood tests for their next six months. So, wow, how easy that would have been. But, but the quality of the data, you might imagine, a, a bit more variable. Now, more 
rigorous clinical trials, really several of them came from the UK, of which Claire played a central role in the PT1 study, where they had done the study of hydroxycarbamide versus enagrolide in patients with ET to see which was better. And again, we do clinical trials for a reason. It was anticipated that this trial would show that enagrolide was better than hydroxycarbamide. That's why the study was done to some degree. And we were shown that, in fact, that was not the case. Again, they each had their own benefit, but that hydroxycarbamide was better, and that is why it's remained the typical frontline therapy for ET. Now, in parallel with clinical trials advancing efforts in MPNs, so did patient meetings, things like this gathering itself. Indeed, there was a patient in the United States who was very influential, uh, a very sharp individual by the name of Joyce Niblack who had a PV that went to MF and she had been a chemist and an attorney. And she was the first one who challenged us back in the 90s to say we should get together physicians and patients in the same room on a full day event and really discuss things to a much greater detail than we ever do in the consultant's room. And have people be able to ask questions directly of the experts, you know, and really challenge them and to learn more. And in that day, that was unheard of. You know, some physicians were terrified about the concept of standing in front of a room of patients and being able to answer questions kind of at will. So not everyone was up for it, but it's really been, I think, very important. It's clearly carried on in many other diseases and for good reason. There are a lot of things during the short consultant visit that you have that it's difficult, there's a lot of information to process, there's a lot of questions that you have, there are questions that you have that'll arise three months from now. And again, those visits that are short, these things have been very, very complimentary. So groups like MP and Voice are really to be congratulated for providing a, a sense of community, but also a forum, you know, so that you, know, you can both help to support each other, but so that you can really be empowered because knowledge is power on a disease like this. You know, there are patients that have come to see me that again, they leave on the same medication they came, but if they understand where they stand with the disease better, they really might be in much better position. There may be less stress or anxiety. They may have greater clarity over next steps. They may make different life decisions in terms of what is ahead in terms of career or family. Now, post-2005 has really been a, a period of, of great progress. We clearly have a ways to go, but without question, the discovery of the JAK2 mutation was really the watershed moment. It was the lightning bolt. It was taking all these diseases that had this era of mystery and said, no, there's a specific genetic change that is playing at least a key role in many of these diseases. That mutation driving the overproduction of blood cells. And then over time, we've learned that there's many other mutations, but they all are working along the same pathway. So I use this, this slot or this discussion in the MF breakout room. But if we think about this as kind of an on-off switch, the MPL mutation, the CalR mutation, the JAK2, they are all interacting with this on-off switch in some way. So why do JAK inhibitors work in people regardless of these mutations? Because they're really working here, and all these things are up here. And likewise, many of the other mutations that we have are impacting this somewhere along the way. So from 2005, really through 2015, is when many of these additional mutations have been identified and how they uh, really drive the diseases. We've learned more about, again, what type of mutations, how they affect individuals, and a complexity that is not to be underestimated in terms of additional changes that really are making up some of the differences that we have. Again, I think even of the MF breakout room, there's a broad range of experiences that were reflected in there. And again, some of these different additional genetic factors, including the other factors that are different between those individuals in terms of their age, their health, their fitness, 
their family genes. You know, we all know families where everyone lives into their 90s and other families where people do not. You know, all of these things are factors. Now, in a slide that's as complicated as the Tokyo subway map, I'll just share with you that this, in just in even a cartoon format, just shows you a little bit of how the physicians and the scientists you've seen here today think about the biology of what's going on. Different stages of how the biology of what is going on in the cells. And you could think medications are different ways of either trying to turn something off or turn something on. And as we think about using more than one therapy, again, you're thinking about, again, if you think about like, let's use the analogy of, of an old equalizer on a stereo, you're trying to change different aspects of music, of bass or treble or other pieces. Again, as we're trying to impact biology, we're trying to impact multiple different pieces. Now from 2005 to now, first we have drugs that are actually approved for myelofibrosis. There was never a drug that had been approved for myelofibrosis before ruxolidinib, not a single one. We used a variety of other drugs that had been used for other conditions. We had done many trials. My career, I had been involved with 40 different trials before the discovery of the JAK2 mutation. Many of these studies were not positive. Some of them had some benefits in anemia, but their benefits were limited. So the discovery of the JAK2 mutation and the medications to impact that have been very impactful. With drugs now, ruxolitinib approved in 2011, vidratum in 2019. Procritum not yet approved in the UK, but likely soon, and in the US since February of this past year. And mamelodinib, which we'll discuss, not approved yet, but may be approved soon. These are really the four that probably will be the anchor of the JAK inhibitors and then other medicines to come. Indeed, as I share with physicians, you know, the next step are really around combinations. Now, these are not the only drugs that have been tested. There have been many other JAK inhibitors that have been tested, some with some benefit, but that have not moved forward for a range of reasons. Now, ruxolitinib improves spleen and symptoms, but a little bit as I had answered the question in the panel discussion, we've learned that these medicines really do more. They can help people live longer. Now, now why do they help people live longer? Probably a range of reasons. Uh, they're stronger. There's probably lower risk of progression. They probably make the bone marrow, which has uh, inflammation and other difficulties, probably helps that to improve. Now, we know these medicines are not a cure, so our work is not done, but they certainly have made a benefit. Now, another thing we've really learned since 2005 <clears throat> is to try to better understand yourselves. You are not all the same. Your experience with your disease is not all the same both in terms of the burden of disease, but also in terms of the risk. Now, the burden of the disease is how does that affect you on a daily basis? Is that a risk of blood clots? Is that symptoms? Is that the spleen being enlarged? If it's enlarged, does it bother you? Does it interfere with you being able to sleep or cause discomfort? Uh, does it impact your blood counts? So that is the burden of the disease. The second, is risk. Now risk, there are two components. In ET or PV, when we speak of risk, we primarily are estimating risk of developing a blood clot or a bleeding event. In myelofibrosis, risk is a very imprecise guess as to how life-threatening the disease might be. And incredibly imprecise. Anyone that tells you that they know how long a person's gonna live is wrong. You know, they are at best a guess. They're even more inaccurate than that because they're a guess based on how people used to behave in the past. Because it's largely by studying people from before, many of whom were before the current medicines that we use now. So they're a very rough guess. They're better than nothing, they can be helpful, but, but they have real limitations. So anyone that says, you know, boy, Ruben, you, you know, you've got 2.4 years left. You know, life just does not work that way. That is 
One, it's probably guessing way too low, to be honest. But two, it is uh, a very uh, broad guess at best. The next thing we have done, and my group has been very passionate about this, is to try to quantify the subjective. So there are many things that a clinician can look at objectively. Your hemoglobin is X value grams per deciliter. Your spleen, we have done an MRI, it is this many cubic centimeters. Now, you could tell me that you have severe itching, and that is uh, the biggest issue that you're facing, but how do we put a number on that? How do we measure that? How does we judge if that has gotten better? Because it's just as important. Now, since we didn't have that before, that was a real limiter, because if you can't measure it, uh, then it's very difficult to include that in terms of, well, do we start a medicine? Do we adjust the dose? Do we try a different medicine, et cetera? So our group with many collaborators who are here, Claire and Mary Francis and many others, developed a series of questionnaires, you may have filled some of these out, that now have really become the standard. We now have tested them in last count almost 30 languages, you know, and they have been used in 80 different countries and are used in every single clinical trial, pretty much globally for MPNs. And indeed in the US, the FDA has used the MPN approach to symptom assessment as the gold standard for other diseases that look for symptoms to be assessed as part of their approval process. So indeed look in all the clinical trials. Now, some of the things we've looked at by studying this is, again, you're not all the same. And you're not all the same as well by illness. So there are patients with MF that have less symptoms than certain patients with ET. We've learned that there are different groupings of severity of symptoms by quartiles. And these can correlate with both biology and other pieces. And again, you can see certain symptoms that are almost straight across, such as fatigue. Again, the standard. Now, I mentioned earlier that we've done some surveys. Claire led the one here in the UK, and I led the one in the US, looking at what patients are feeling, uh, their knowledge of the disease, and other priorities that they have. A and indeed, we asked also about asking about symptoms and how we do that better. Now, symptoms are now a key way that we judge new therapies. Mamelodinib is a new JAK inhibitor that just completed a phase three trial that showed improvement in, it was for individuals that had symptoms who had failed ruxolitinib, and showed that it was better for symptoms, improving spleen, and improving anemia than the comparator of danazole. So again, critical in terms of this agent. Now, when we started this journey, there were physicians who said, well, your patients say they have symptoms. I don't necessarily believe them. I think that they're just stressed and anxious. I have two patients with MPNs in my practice and neither of them complain about symptoms. The reality, of course, is something different. We have learned that probably 90% of patients have at least something. And sometimes they don't realize they have something until it's better in terms of the symptoms that they have. There have been patients who have asked, well, where do the uncertainty of the future fit into this equation? And the reality is it does have an impact. So there are higher rates of stress or anxiety due to the uncertainty. Hopefully events like this and the efforts of Folks like MPN Voice make a difference. I hear Tuesday there's going to be a webinar about stem cell transplantation. Again, that can be a very stress-inducing topic. Anything you can do to demystify that has real value. Now, we're looking on trying to go after these diseases in different ways. In the U.S., we have groups of investigators looking at the stem cell in myelofibrosis, the very essence of the bone marrow and how we can try to target that in a better way. We developed treatment guidelines. Treatment guidelines are made by panels, including this facetious panel from the 50s. And I like to use the analogy that, that guidelines are like guardrails on a road. They give you a sense of what are the possible options. 
But make no mistake that medicine is an art. Because what option to use in which setting for which patient at which time is an art form. And that when you have a disease like an MPN, you are an equal part of the decision making. What you are feeling, what your goals are, uh, what you are interested in trying or not trying is a very important part uh, of the discussion. The more engaged you are with your clinician, probably the better off your treatment will be, including be very, being very honest if you're having side effects or negative effects with your medication. The, the clinician's office is not the place to, to have the, the stiff upper lip you know, and not complain if you're having negative effects from your disease or your medication. And indeed, even as we look at our treatments and our guidelines for physicians, it's where we really see that we have the gaps, and that is where we put the clinical trials. Now, where do we go in the future? Well, one, we have a period of clinical trials unlike any period in the future. Does that mean everyone should be on a clinical trial? Probably not. Our clinical trials are in general for areas where what your circumstance is, we either might have room for improvement or you're not doing well. In myelofibrosis, there are many clinical trials. In ET and PV, it can be more specific. So if you have an appropriate clinical trial, please certainly do consider it. But also realize that if you're doing well and stable, there may it may be not appropriate for you to be on a clinical trial because we generally are not doing clinical trials on patients who are doing well and stable. We're doing it for individuals in which there is an unmet need. We know we're trying to work forward with more precise and personalized care. You are not your clone. You know, so I've heard people say, well, I've got a 65-year-old CalR positive, uh, you know, female. Like, you know, that is an individual. You know, and the, and the fact that there's CalR, that clone, all of that is well and good, but you put that same clone in two different individuals, there may be very, very different experiences, even in terms of how the disease behaves, let alone in terms of their health. Increasingly, we weave all of this genetic information into our complex care. We realize, again, whether we're talking about MPNs or other illnesses, that it takes a team of individuals to care for you your GP, uh, potentially your cardiologist, your gynecologist, uh, a psychologist, uh, a dermatologist. Uh, again, a team of individuals is helpful, particularly depending upon the, the condition that you face. Now, which ways are we trying to improve? We are trying to make better therapies for MPNs along every path imaginable including many ways that we're making progress across cancers overall. One critical one that we have not yet made progress in blood diseases like an MPN is in harnessing the power of the immune system. The power of the immune system has been transformative in diseases like melanoma, lung cancer, kidney cancer, and several others, yet has not yet made an impact on other diseases. We study this. We try to see why is that the case. And again, many ways that the immune system may one day make an impact. There is even data at the next American Society of Hematology meeting that again may give us new insight into some other approaches that may be beneficial. One of these can be cellular-based therapies. Again, all of these are future state, but I raise them just to share with you many things are on the horizon. One of these is even using ways to edit genes, or what's called CRISPR. Now this is being used initially in diseases where we only have one mutation, and they are not malignant diseases, such as sickle cell anemia. And those studies are looking promising. Now in MPNs, there are both technical and biological complexities that we will need to overcome, but overcome them we will. Part of the complexity is again, which gene, if we could fix, are we going to repair? And if you have more than one gene that has been affected, how do we repair more than one gene? 
So part of the complexity, again, this is a little bit of the sausage being made in the background, but know that it is being made, that people are studying each and every aspect of it. What are the medicines that might help Im improve where you stand in 2023? But also in parallel, what are the things that really might have an impact you know, in 2027 or 2028? Indeed, even as we stand, there's over 18 trials looking at CRISPR in patients with blood diseases alone. Now, one final thing our group has been very involved with is trying to look at how else can we help people feel better with an MPN? You know, and I've shared with folks, you know, if you're not sleeping well, if you don't exercise and you do not have a good diet, there's no medicine I can prescribe for you that is going to make you feel well. That is just part of the reality. So how else? One, how do we improve the medical part, but how do we empower you in a way to try to help you feel better. We currently have a grant from the US government looking at meditation as one of the aspects. We had previously done a trial in MPNs where we showed a decrease in inflammation and improvement in sleep with meditation. We now are doing a 300 person study for patients with blood diseases overall, looking at a meditation app to improve sleep, fatigue, and inflammation. So my MPN history, you know, we started with the biology of MPNs, trying to develop better treatments, advancing the quality of MPN broader cancer care, understanding the burden that you all face, non-pharmacologic options, and the biology of disease burden. So all of this is only possible really because of the tremendous community that MPNs have. You know, being involved with many different diseases, from pancreas to brain to breast to colon to uh, carcinoid, the MPN community is very special. Uh, it is very global. It is very supportive. It's very positive, and it is tremendously collaborative. So, enormous thanks to folks like MPN Voice, like our wonderful colleagues here in the UK, uh, patients really around the world that generously have given of their time in many of these efforts, participation really selflessly in clinical trials to make a difference. I know of many people who've joined a clinical trial that said, you know, I hope it helps me, but boy, I'm really doing this because I hope that it helps someone else. So again, thanks for all that you do and a thanks, wonderful thanks to my group. And with that, I will hand it back over to our organizers. Thank you. Ruben, as always, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Now, before we close, there's one person here who has done so much for MPN Voice. We wouldn't be where we are today without her enthusiasm, without her uh, wonderful presence. And on behalf of the MPN team, I'd like to present Claire with a bouquet. Thank you, Claire. So they, they asked me to, to say just a word or two. One, because it, it, it is delicious to embarrass Claire, <laughs> you know, it, 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 in, such, in such a venue. Uh, the, the, the tr truly friend, the truly a, a, a sister in our efforts together. But, you know, let me share with you just a little bit of the, the tireless effort that I have witnessed Claire over these many years, the, the passion the, the late nights, the uh, unbelievable dedication as a clinician, uh, a deeply involved investigator, but so selfless in terms of efforts like this, like MPN Voice being a resource for you, really uh, helping with all of her colleagues here in the UK to make uh, an unbelievable impact uh, on MPN. So uh, enough cannot be said, whether it's the 1 a.m. email response from Claire 
uh, adjusting the, the design of a clinical trial to uh, answering an email that comes from around the world on a pregnant patient with an MPN who is in Southern Africa that needs advice. It truly is tireless, uh, it's endless, and although it is, I'm sure, embarrassing her like crazy, <laughs> it is unbelievably well-deserved. Congratulations, Claire. much that was very very unexpected I was actually outside on the phone to my mother but anyway <laughs> she would say I um, perhaps don't do enough for her um, <clears throat> one can never do enough for one's family um, Ruben thank you so much um, for coming all the way to London we've been doing these meetings for 20 years I think you've been here for almost every single one and the one that you couldn't come to you recorded um, for us. So actually, you are someone who works equally tirelessly. Um, all of you contribute to the community. Nona, you've also been doing this for 20 years. And Tim, you, you, you make sure our finances are all straight, even though when, when the financial documents are like hundreds of pages long, because they come from the NHS and they're rubbish. Anyway, um, the inspiration comes from patients for every single clinician who's here today and every single person who's here today has given up time tirelessly. So these are flowers for you too. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Nona. Thank you to Derry. Thank you to Richard. Thank you to Julie and the team. Thank you to everybody who's online and um, John, who's the co-chair of MPN Voice with Nona. We miss you. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Please take care, everybody, and have a safe journey home, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.